All right, let's get started. Good evening. Thanks for coming in on this really warm day. I thought I was going to say thanks for coming in on this really cold day, but no, it's a really warm day. So welcome. This is maybe the sixth or seventh uh, event on secrecy, transparency, whistleblowing, leaks, et cetera, NSA, et cetera, that we've done uh, since last spring. And I, I guess we're going to probably do about seven more in uh, the days that are coming. You saw today's news about uh, what happened uh, in the Senate and the issue of the CIA and the Senate Intelligence uh, Select Committee report on interrogation, something that this center has been waiting for for a long time since I can't remember the event we did on it however many uh, months ago, certainly more than a year ago. And, and it's... I'm, I'm trying to think of the overall label for all of this, between the whistleblowing and the leaking and the secrecy, and I can't really think of, of any one concept that, that encapsulates it all, but we know the space when we see it. And I guess what it all comes down to is trust between government and uh, us. And if you don't have protections for whistleblowers, then you don't have protections for us. And if you don't have leakers that are, um, that are able to speak in one way, shape, or another, then you don't have protections for us. And so the only way you can distinguish between leakers and whistleblowers is to trust in the system. So I guess it's one more uh, um, example of where the system seems to have broken down in this century. And our panelists are going to tell you all the reasons it's broken down and all the solutions and remedies. So by the time you leave here tonight, you will have a blueprint of, 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 of how we should be thinking, which we're still waiting. We're so, um, we, I mean by the media, the public sphere, is, I think has been spending so much time reacting to events in the secrecy transparency sphere that we haven't had a lot of time to generate some strong policy recommendations. So whether it's tonight or in the future, that's what the direction I hope this particular part of the center's work goes. So welcome. Tonight's panel is wonderful, and I'm not going to introduce them, but I am going to introduce the moderator. Um, as you know, um, the Center on National Security here at Fordham has done several events over the past few months with the Penn American Center. Suzanne Nossel is the executive director of the center, and um, we've found that in that space between dedication to free expression and understanding what it means for an open society and a democratic society, and the problems that the United States faces right now in terms of uh, transparency and secrecy issues, there's a very nice fit between the policy world and the more literary, philosophical, and thoughtful world. And so we're trying out a number of different uh, formats to come up with a a bigger project that we will let you know about in the future. I'm sure many of you know Suzanne. She was an assistant secretary of state. Uh, she has uh, been the CEO of Human Rights Watch. Uh, she um, directed um, Amnesty International USA. I think you can understand that she's a perfect person to talk about where the policy sphere of uh, secrecy, transparency, and the public good intersect. So without further ado, Suzanne. Thanks so much, Karen, and we're thrilled to be partnering here with the Fordham Center on National Security once again for our third event. Uh, and I, we too have found this to be a very fruitful interaction between uh, Penn as an organization of writers dedicated to free expression and the center which, with its mission of fostering debate and shining a light on vital issues of national security and opening up public debates and discussions such as this. And I too kind of read today's developments and, and Diane Feinstein's rather extraordinary speech uh, in the Senate today accusing the CIA of wiping documents off of the computers of Senate Intelligence Committee staff who are investigating the interrogations and detention as part of the, the putting together of this vital Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence report on interrogations and torture. So she's now accused the CIA of essentially hacking into the Senate staff's computers and, and erasing, deleting, and rendering inaccessible these documents. And the CIA has denied it, but they have admitted that they 
came to the view that the Senate staffers had unlawfully obtained copies of an internal CIA review document, uh, this so-called Panetta report, and that they lodged an investigation into how the Senate staff got this report. And Feinstein has said that it was produced along with millions of other documents, uh, and that they, they obtained these copies, which were draft copies, perfectly lawfully. The CIA contends otherwise. The CIA has also asked the Department of Justice to investigate the Senate staff. And uh, Senator Feinstein said today that the White House was behind this, that the White House played a role in instigating this uh, CIA investigation. And she's also decried the involvement of the Justice Department as a, a tactic of intimidation against the Senate and the Senate staff and the work of her committee. And reading all of this, you know, what I can only, my only reaction is that the real casualty here is the truth. How are we ever going to get to the bottom of the role that these different bodies have, are playing vis-a-vis -vis one another in this incredibly contorted sequence of events that relies on the different technologies that arms of our government are using to spy on one another, to uh, probe, to carry out both legitimate and potentially illegitimate activities. And seems like what you really want in this situation is the righteous individual, the truth teller. Somebody's going to come forward and explain to us what is actually going on. And yet, at the same time, what strikes me thinking about tonight's panel is, and I know we'll get into this, how profoundly ambivalent we are when those truth tellers step forward. And we held a, held a debate here, uh, and I know some of you were, were present about six weeks ago, about Edward Snowden and whether he is a, a traitor or a hero, in essence, whether he deserves clemency or punishment. And whether it's Brad Manning or Tom Drake, there is a deep-seated ambivalence that Americans feel about the people who have stepped forward to shine a light and to tell the truth. And tonight, we're going to understand and learn why. And I, I, I don't think we could have a better panel, a more diverse and well-informed panel to help shed light on all of this. And I'm going to introduce them all uh, briefly now, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to them to each make a brief presentation, and then I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for the final half hour of the evening. I'm going to start with Ray McGovern. He's a retired 27-year CIA analyst, now a public advocate for the responsible behavior and use of information by US intelligence agencies. He leads the Speaking Truth to Power section of the publisher, Tell the World, Tell the Word. Next, we'll have Mike German, who is a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice, their Liberty and National Security Program, and he focuses on law enforcement and intelligence oversight and reform. Then we'll welcome Julia Angwin, who's a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist who writes for ProPublica and is the author of the recently released Dragnet Nation, a quest for privacy, security, and freedom in a world of relentless surveillance, which just came out, and we have copies of her book uh, for sale in the lobby. And then finally, David Posen, who is an associate professor of law at Columbia Law School and has written extensively on constitutional law, national security law, public law, and information law and policy. So I welcome all of them, and we're going to start this evening with Ray McGovern. Over to you, Ray. Thank you, Suzanne. I'd like to, since I'm first, uh, call some witnesses here. Presente, um, the first American whistleblower. Uh, some of you may not have heard of him, but he intercepted some messages between the governor of Massachusetts before the revolution uh, to the King of England uh, saying these riffraff colonists should never enjoy the same rights as English citizens. And that person was caught, and he was, he was called every name in the book, including all the ones that have been given to Edward Snowden, including narcissists and, and the likes of it. The names were so bad that the London Daily Press wouldn't even uh, play what the Attorney General called colonists uh, for the colonial regime. The fellow's name was Benjamin Franklin, and the year was uh, 240 years ago, 1973. He came out all right. 
There's another, there's a person in this audience that I'd like to ask to stand up. He's Peter Van Buren. Peter, I don't see you. Uh, can you, ah, there you are. Now, Peter is a State Department Foreign Service officer, whistleblower, who spent a long time in Iraq. And when he came back, he tried to expose uh, fraud, waste, and abuse among the uh, occupation forces, wrote a book about it, We Meant Well. Uh, in retaliation for which he was uh, banished from the State Department. They tried to withhold his, punch, his t pension. They tried to indict him, and all that blew over because the Government Accountability Office, the Government Accountability Project, stepped in, and now um, uh, Peter enjoys the pension that he so richly deserved. So that's number two. And number three, um, the witness that I would call would be a fellow named uh, James Clapper, who exactly one year ago tomorrow uh, was asked, uh, does the National Security Agency collect any data at all on millions or tens of millions of Americans? And he said, no, sir. That's significant, folks. Uh, you know what happened to him, right? <laughs> you know what didn't happen to him? He's still National Intelligence Director. Figure that out. Now, when Edward Snowden saw that, and he said this now, that was what we used to call in Fordham philosophy, the proximate cause, okay? He had seen these violations of the Constitution. He took seriously his oath to defend and protect the Constitution. And when James Clapper lied before Congress under oath without any consequences, he said, this has got to stop. He went to his superiors who were singularly uninterested. And one of the things that you don't know is, unless you read Forbes magazine, no left-wing rag, Forbes, one of uh, Edward Snowden's co-workers in Honolulu went to Forbes and said, you know, I'm really kind of ticked off at all the, all the names they're calling this really, really bright fellow who helped us out so much in Honolulu. Um, you know, you should know he had a copy of the Constitution of the United States on his desk. And every now and then, he'd interrupt what we were doing, and he'd wave that thing. It was all dog-eared. And he'd say, hey, how about this Fourth Amendment? You know? What about this Fourth Amendment? The right of the people to be secure from unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue except upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly defining the places to be searched and the people or, or things to be seized. How does what we're doing square with that? And they all said, and she, the, the source said, well, you know, we all said, hey, Ed, forget about it. Uh, really nice here in Honolulu, uh, six-digit six, uh, salaries here. Forget about it. But he wouldn't forget about it, and that's what makes him such an extraordinary man. Now, I think we have to call these witnesses before us because it's really terribly important to, to stress the oath that many of us swore uh, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, I've been asked on many uh, occasions, uh, usually on the air or on TV, yeah, but he, he violated his oath. He didn't violate his oath. He's in deep trouble because he respected and honored his oath. We said, well, what about his oath to be secret? He took no oath to be secret. He filled out this form here. Classified Information Non-Disclosure Agreement, which we all signed as a condition of employment. And in this, he, he, he vowed not to reveal information that would harm the security of the United States. That's what he promised. This is a promise. Are promises important? Of course they are. You don't break promises, you know, capriciously. But, you know, the theologians tell me there's a label for comparing an oath to a promise, and that is that an oath supersedes, or actually the ethicists say supervenes. It's a supervening value, okay? All these decisions are circumstantial, and when you have an oath to the Constitution, that's a supervening value. Now, 
before I run out of time, and I only have three or four more minutes, I want to uh, just tell you that there are all kinds of examples that I could have used from my 50 years of experience down in Washington about uh, the need for whistleblowing, how I blew my chance to blow the whistle during Vietnam, how I didn't have the guts at the age of 28 with all the education and training I had in moral theology and everything else here at Fordham, I didn't have the guts to read this cable to the New York Times, which by the way, for the younger of you, it was a relatively independent newspaper at the time. <laughs> and if, if you gave them something to, to, uh, that was hard, a cable from Saigon that said this from the commanding officer in Saigon, we can't possibly accept the higher numbers that we analysts had attributed to the communists under arms in South Vietnam. Our higher numbers were 600,000, okay? The US military in Saigon was saying 299,000. Westmoreland, the general, had put a limit, no enemy over 299,000, imagine, okay? So here's what uh, his deputy Abrams wrote on the 20th of August, 1967. We can't accept the higher figures because, quote, they are in sharp contrast to the current overall strength figure of about 299,000 that we always give to the press. We have been projecting an image of success over recent months and all available caveats, this is continued to quote, all available caveats and explanations will not prevent the press from drawing an erroneous and gloomy conclusion, end quote. Now, I, I could have gotten a copy of that cable from my friend Sam Adams, who was the analyst on this. I could have taken it down to the New York Times. And guess what, folks? How many of you know what the Vietnam Memorial looks like in Washington? Okay, so you know it's in a V, right? Well, if we had spoken out then with the cable, as Dan Ellsberg always urges, bring the document, okay? There's a good chance that by the next year, early the next year, April, that that war would have been sort of tapering off and, and these casualties would have started. In other words, the left wing, the west part, the whole west part of that V wouldn't be there because there'd be no names to chisel into that granite. And my friend Sam Adams went to an early death at 55, full of remorse that he went through channels, got diddled, and uh, the war went on. Now, that's a heavy burden to, to carry, and that's one reason why I feel that I need to support all the whistleblowers, even if they're only 22, like Bradley Manning, even if they're only 29, like Ed Snowden, okay? And the people inside, and I'll finish with this, the people inside the CIA and in the DIA are rising to the occasion. And I'll tell you something that you don't know. When John Kerry got up on the 30th of August and said 35 times, we know the Bashar al-Assad was responsible for those chemical weapon attacks there near, near Damascus. We know, we know, we know. You know, Shakespeare said, me thinks he doth protest too much. Well, he didn't know, and he still doesn't know. The evidence adduced, bought by the government, bought by Human Rights Watch, for example, that the tra trajectory of these missiles and the range of these missiles show that missiles with chemical weapons came from government-controlled areas, they've all been thoroughly discredited. We know that the rebels had sarin, they still do. So do we know who did it? We don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a damn lie to say 35 times that we know, particularly when that brought us this close to what John Kerry called a unbelievably small war against Syria. So this is really important. What I'm saying is that there is a, a kind of a, we say a remnant in biblical terms, a remnant of, of people who still feel honest enough that they'll speak out. And I know some of these people and they said, Mr. President, 
Don't call this an intelligence es estimate. Don't call this an intelligence document. Call it a government document, if you will, but not an intelligence, because we're not going to do Iraq again, okay? We're not going to do Iraq again, and I'm very proud of those folks. So you can do whistleblowing from the inside, and you can do it from the outside. I'm very proud of those young people who did it from the outside when they had no other avenue to, to go, and uh, I don't want to use up anybody else's time now. I'd be happy to entertain questions later. Thank you. Hi, my name's Mike German. First, thanks for having me here. Um, when I joined the FBI in 1988, I had no idea I would uh, have to become an expert in whistleblower law uh, or an advocate for whistleblowers. Um, but unfortunately, after 14 years, saw something that was illegal and thought my job as a law enforcement officer was to report illegal things. Uh, but that started an odyssey that, uh, that left me uh, bewildered about how the FBI reacted actually falsifying internal records to cover up what was really a fairly minor mistake initially um, and uh, surprised me with the reaction uh, because I expected that there would be something to protect me. I had never gone outside. I had never uh, I was, as, as Ray says, a, a little too chicken to do anything with classified information after signing that document. So this was totally internally, and yet the reaction of the agency to try to protect itself from any criticism uh, was overwhelming. And what I found was what had uh, been described as whistleblower protection process within the FBI actually didn't really work and was designed not to work. It was designed to fail. So I thought maybe the easiest thing would be to do would be to sort of lay out kind of what is the lie. I mean, a lot of the criticism of Snowden and Chelsea Manning before that and other whistleblowers, it's why didn't they follow the proper procedures? Then, you know, they could have had their concerns addressed and, and it would have worked out. Um, so, so I'll give you an idea of what the procedures are like. Um, the Whistleblower Protection Act uh, was passed in 188 or 1989, right, as I was joining the FBI, uh, but it exempted the FBI and the intelligence community. The, uh, the Department of Justice was directed to write uh, regulations to create a system within the FBI and Justice Department which would mirror the system other federal employees got through uh, the Whistleblower Protection Act but would not allow them to go outside the department. Um, it took 10 years for the Department of Justice to write these regulations uh, and only did when, when it was discovered by Senator Grassley that they had failed to, to uh, cover that part of the law. Uh, but for the rest of the intelligence community, they were left with nothing. It wasn't until 1998 that an Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act was passed, uh, which was a bit of a misnomer because while it created a process for internal whistleblowers to report matters of urgent concern to Congress, through the inspector general and their uh, chain of command, it actually provided no protections. <laughs> so all it turned out to be was a system where the, the whistleblower would identify himself to the agency. The IG would be the gatekeeper as to whether it actually got to Congress, and then he was left, he or she would be left to suffer the retaliation with no avenue for protection. So the idea that there was a system that was set up uh, that, that any of these whistleblowers could have followed that would have protected them and actually allowed their concerns to be addressed is, is actually simply not true. Um, in in uh, Congress over the last couple of years, the House actually passed a good bill that would have uh, created a whistleblower protection capability that, that would have been similar to what other federal employees have, uh, but it was always killed by the Senate Intelligence Committee. And we opened with a uh, discussion of Senator Feinstein's uh, really compelling uh, speech on the, on the floor today, and I urge you all to read it. In discussing how this document that the CIA is so angry about the Senate committee getting, uh, she said, we still don't know how the Senate committee got it, but we know it came from the CIA. It was in, in their room that they provided for our staffers, but it may have come from a whistleblower. That whistleblower is completely unprotected from any retaliation if, if he or she exists. 
And Senator Feinstein is actually, even though her committee is now the benefit, beneficiary of that disclosure, has, has actually been an impediment to passing protections for intelligence community whistleblowers. Uh, what finally came out of the Senate was, was a very washed down version of the House bill uh, that basically created a system that was almost like the FBI system, which is wholly inadequate, uh, but actually so bad that, that the advocates working on the bill suggested they take the FBI out because it wasn't clear what they were creating was actually gonna create any improvement for the FBI and if they did it, <laughs> Uh, in a way that was damaging, could have actually been worse. Uh, then it went over to uh, Mike Rogers' committee, the House Intelligence Committee, who again is one of the bigger uh, antagonists towards Snowden and says, you know, there were processes to follow and his committee took it out of the bill. Uh, President Obama, to his credit, uh, put basically that weak provision into Presidential Directive 19 uh, that, that required the agencies to set up internal processes, but that has been languishing since October 2012. It's not clear any agency actually has this internal process, and we know that the one uh, part of the directive that had a deadline, which was for the Department of Justice to do a study of the effectiveness of the FBI's internal process, is over a year overdue. So they're continuing to drag their feet on this, and that's why I think you have people like uh, Chelsea Manning and, and Snowden going around these procedures that do nothing but, but identify them for retaliation and actually just bringing that information straight to the public. And uh, for those of you who didn't see the piece I wrote in The Guardian today, uh, who, who knows who Jeffrey Delisle is? I assume you all know who, who Edward Snowden is. Yes. Why is it that you don't know who Jeffrey Delisle is? Jeffrey Delisle was a Canadian naval officer who uh, had access to U.S. signals intelligence because of the Five Eyes Agreement. The intelligence community works with uh, the four other English-speaking countries uh, to share signals intelligence. And he had access to this material and walked into the Russian embassy in Canada and offered to spy for them and did so for almost five years before being caught. And every month would download a thumb drive of classified intelligence and give it to the Russians on a monthly basis for 50 months. So you can imagine if what we're talking about here is really security, that would be a part of these discussions. The fact that this information is so accessible by so many people, the intelligence community now they say five million people have security clearances. It's huge, and you know, if Snowden shows anything, shows us anything, it's that their document controls are not so great, right? So, you know, to our benefit, Ed Snowden had 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 our interests in mind and let us know what our government is doing. But for the others out there, there may be tremendous security flaws that are happening that aren't part of this discussion because of the hyper focus on shutting down whistleblowers and press links. And I think the purpose of that is because what they're really concerned about is shutting down internal and external dissent to what they're doing. And, and really this discussion of protecting whistleblowers is, is about maintaining democratic control over the intelligence community and that's why it's so important. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, it's great to be here, thanks for coming. I, um, as a journalist, I'm on the other side of this equation, right? I'm trying to convince people to tell me things that you know is sometimes might endanger their jobs and uh, I can't tell them that their whistleblower processes are gonna be any use to them, right? And so this is a very difficult situation that journalists find themselves in. And I thought I would talk a little bit about just what it takes to try to have secure communications with a source these days. And I thought I'd start this though just with a little bit of a history about well, how did I how did I get into this? Um, I'm a technology journalist. I've always written about technology. I grew up in the Silicon Valley and I love technology. And so I've always 
written about it and thought it was really empowering people. But in 2009, I started to notice that the companies that I covered were actually in the business, it seemed, of selling and trading personal data. And so I launched a series at the Wall Street Journal called What They Know, basically about what do they know about us and why are they selling all our data? Of course, now I joke that we should do a series called What Don't They Know? <laughs> Anyways, um, so as I started to educate myself about corporate surveillance, I started to notice that that information then also ended up in the hands of the government. And as I started to try to cultivate sources on that front, I had to teach myself a lot of skills because people were justifiably very concerned about talking to a journalist in a situation where we have basically ubiquitous surveillance. There's no way to really have a conversation with someone that couldn't be monitored, right? So if you send an email, there's an email trail. If you call, we already know that every phone call is in the NSA dragnet. Um, so you drive to their house. Well, there's a cell phone location record of your phone being nearby. So fine, leave your phone at home. Okay, then you can do that, and then you can't call anyone. <laughs> so. That's a good strategy, going to people's house without your phone, and another good strategy is possibly writing letters. And this is, by the way, not the most effective way to pursue journalism. So, um, so I've tried all these other things. So I have a book outside called Dragnet Nation, which is about how do you live in a world of ubiquitous surveillance. And it's not entirely about the journalistic efforts. It's also about how I protect my family and um, just try to live a private life. But I'm going to focus here in this discussion on the journalistic techniques. So for instance, um, one of the things that I've had to do as a journalist is consider the ubiquity of social networks. So when you join a social network, they immediately put up a whole list of your friends. And that's the worst thing for a journalist, is to have all these people listed as your possible sources. In fact, it's just as bad if they are your source or if they aren't your source, because either way, they're going to fall under suspicion when your article comes out. So I basically felt I was doing a disservice to my actual friends by even putting them on a, a list that could be publicly viewed. So I began um, by deciding that my approach to Facebook would be to friend everybody. Um, this was a very unfortunate exercise. I began this in 2009 when Facebook said you could no longer make your friends list private. And so I accepted every friend request. I had a lot of friends in Brazil and the Ukraine. Um, and I uh, got a lot of spam. It made Facebook basically unusable for me. And then um, over time, I realized that it actually wasn't working because you could still see my actual friends amongst those friends. So I decided to unfriend everybody. <laughs> so um, I unfriended everybody at the beginning of this year. And that was also really painful. My mother was offended. And so, so, so um, a lot of people thought that I was going to unfriend everyone except them. Um, so now I have this absurd profile on Facebook that says, I am not here. I have a complicated relationship with Facebook. <laughs> Please read about that relationship on my blog. Um, <laughs> Similarly, I deleted my LinkedIn profile because it's the same thing. You're, all your connections are exposed. And people don't think about it. You know, Even people who might be a source of mine don't think, oh, I'm going to be exposed. They just sort of automatically, after they talk to you at a party, send you a LinkedIn invitation. And I just decided that that wasn't a fair situation to put people in. So I had to ditch the social networks. I'm still on Twitter because I've decided that um, following someone on Twitter doesn't actually imply the same kind of relationship that friends and connections do. Um, but then, that's not enough in any way. I um, also realized that I couldn't, I needed to protect my web browsing because actually what I search for online or what I'm looking at online is very much an indication of what I'm reporting on. So, uh, the, you know, if, if nothing else, Google would certainly have a very good window into what I'm reporting on if I'm using Google search all the time. And as a person who writes about surveillance by corporations, I often am writing about Google. So I had to leave Google. I joined a search engine called DuckDuckGo, which keeps no logs and has no record of my searches. So it doesn't finish my sentences the way that Google does. You know how nice it is when they, you're typing and then it just fills it in for you. Um, DuckDuckGo doesn't know what I'm looking for. It doesn't know where I live. So when I search for uh, Natural History Museum, it gives me the one in London, unless I write New York, <laughs> right? Google will never make that mistake. But I find it kind of reassuring to type those extra two words. Uh, it makes me feel like I definitely know that I am um, not being monitored. 
And you know, it's not that Google, it's not necessarily Google's fault. I'm not against Google, they're a great search engine. But what we've learned also from the Snowden revelations is that the government really loves all that information at Google, right? They go over there with these secret court orders to get it. We don't know what they got. And then we also saw kind of shockingly that they were hacking into Google data centers. And that's also really disturbing that they, if they can't get it through the front door, they might be coming in through the back door. So I had to remove myself from that equation. But this is still not enough. I um, then decided that I needed to get a burner phone because my phone is tied to my identity and if I call a source on that phone, then they, there's a record of that. So I went and bought a phone with cash and a prepaid disposable plan and I used that to call people. But you know what happens when you call people from a different number? They don't answer. <laughs> so this is really ineffective. I, I, I took the burner phone with me on a reporting trip to Washington, D.C., and I would say like half of my meetings fell through because people are also so conditioned, right? You make an appointment to meet. We're like, okay, we're going to meet at 3 o'clock at this coffee shop. But then there's this whole like, I'm five minutes away. I'm, I'm confirming on text. And I wasn't able to do any of that because I had a different number with me. So then some people just thought I wasn't there or, you know. And, then, and so once again, the burner phone was not a particularly great solution. I also s tried to use encryption, right? The, we've been told that um, by Snowden, actually, at South by Southwest, he, he spoke on a live stream, and he said encryption works. It's why I've been able to have any secure communications. And so I have set myself up on all sorts of encryption programs. I can do encrypted instant messaging, and I can do encrypted texting, and I can do encrypted phone calls, and I can do encrypted email. You name it, I can do it. However, I can't get any of my sources to do it. It's the because this software is so incredibly unusable that even people who are complete experts really struggle with it. I remember sitting at a bar with a source and I was showing this person how to install this encryption app, and then like we were checking to make sure that it worked, and it took an hour and a half. And then after that, we go our separate ways. I keep texting on this, you know, secure texting system. The source never replies just calls me regular on the phone line. She's like, this is too much work for me, Julia. I was like, okay, but you know, this is also a problem. We need to have secure communications. So encryption has been a really difficult situation for me. Um, then there's the problem of my address book. So in the old days, there were reporters in the newsroom who actually took their Rolodex at the end of the day and locked it in their drawer at the end of the day because they were concerned. Well, nowadays, our Rolodex is kind of with us. It's in our phone, and it's maybe on our computer, and sometimes it's synced in the cloud <laughs> between those two. And so it's harder to secure. So I um, have tried to, I have an encrypted cloud service, which costs $200 a year. I um, try not to sync any of my data, which means that oftentimes I don't have it, which is really annoying. And um, so I also have this problem that when you cross international borders, you have to, um, you have to be concerned about your electronic devices being searched because there's no um, probable cause needed. So I now cannot take any of my devices that contain any of my contact lists across borders. So I basically travel, as I say, zero data across international borders, which is really inconvenient as well. And so finally, the last thing I would say is that um, one thing that I do have hope for is that my news organization and many others have set up a system called SecureDrop, which is basically a way for whistleblowers to send us documents securely. It requires the person on the other end to install a bunch of software and use these anonymizing services and follow instructions fairly well in order to send us these documents. But I do have some hope that there might be people who will come out of the woodwork and use this system, and hopefully it is actually a secure as we think it is. But at any rate, I would just say it's a hard world for whistleblowers who want to get in, in contact with people like me. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, so I'm going to try to uh, uh, touch on uh, several of the themes that have been raised already, although as the academic on the panel uh, in, a, in a somewhat more esoteric register. Um, uh, the first issue I thought I'd say a few words on is um, one that Ray raised, I think, which is um, how to conceptualize Edward Snowden. Uh, it's kind of, a, you might think of it as a predicate question to how we want to go about reform. Um, just what do we make of, of, of Snowden and what he did? Um, there are many dimensions to that, um, but 
labels seem to be important here, and in particular, people have, have recently been debating whether or not Snowden is a civil disobedient. Um, that, that label is fraught, you know, because um, uh, civil disobedience is generally valorized in American culture. Um, and so I thought I'd say a few words about why um, it's difficult, why I, think it, why I think it's difficult to come down firmly uh, either way on that question. It's not dispositive of whether or not he was justified, but just it goes to the ambivalence that um, uh, we started off talking about and it characterizes a lot of people's reactions here. Um, so, um, okay, why is it difficult? So on, on a lot of accounts of civil disobedience, um, the, the, the actor has to first give some kind of advance notice of the intention to break the law, um, attempt often to, uh, to attempt to negotiate in advance of resorting to law breaking, um, uh, kind of exhaust one's lawful remedies before you turn to illegality. Um, and that's a marker of one's respect for the legal system. Um, so in some sense, Snowden, you know, spectacularly failed on that dimension. Um, the leaks just exploded into public view. Um, but of course, in this case, uh, I think Snowden would say, um, what would it have looked like <laughs> to have given advance notice of what I intended to do? Um, I, it would have been self-defeating. You know, I would have been shut down immediately um, for reasons that Mike touched on and others. The whistleblowing channels that are statutorily provided aren't well set up to handle uh, my kind of critique, uh, might have exposed me to retaliation. Um, so there's a real question about whether the prior notice um, uh, element could, could have realistically been, uh, been met here. Um, uh, second, um, there's, a, there's a related notion that the civil disobedient has to um, use the least unlawful means possible, minimize collateral damage, have a, have a surgical kind of uh, uh, intervention. And some people critique Snowden on this score as well. He released, or he took with him so many documents. Um, uh, why did he have to do that? Um, I think it's complicated there as well because, as I understand it, Snowden's critique is a kind of total critique of the NSA. He does not have a surgical accusation of this little discrete program over here went too far in this respect. That kind of thing is what whistleblower laws um, can, if well designed, uh, pick up pretty well. Um, discrete allegations of abuse. But he had a much more systemic critique. Yes, even though the FISA court signed off on a lot of this, even though congressional overseers signed off on it, um, the whole thing is rotten. And uh, uh, so there too, it's tough to get your head around what least unlawful means would have looked like for Snowden, or whether that's a fair um, requirement to impose on him. Uh, third, um, some accounts of civil disobedience, most associated with Hannah Arendt and Michael Walzer, say that it has to be group action. Um, definitionally, civil disobedience is collective action. You can't, you can't be a solitary civil disobedient. You have to um, uh, enlist comrades uh, uh, in the cause, or else kind of um, uh, 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 it's too idiosyncratic and, and, and not necessarily um, uh, serious enough, and but whistleblowing, I think, is is tough on that dimension as well. Whistleblowing uh, leaking is kind of necessarily a solitary act, given the secrecy that is required to pull it off. Tough to think about what collective action would have looked like uh, prior to the to the whistleblowing uh, in Snowden's case. If he had sought out uh, uh, colleagues, um, uh, he might have been stopped. Um, okay. Uh, 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 fourth, uh, other people. Th um, have argued that civil disobedience has to directly resist the law that is seen as wrongful. Um, if you think a law you know, that, that requires segregation uh, 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 is unjust, um, you, you should violate that law and thereby expose that very law's wrongness through your conduct. Um, uh, that's also tough. In the 14th Amendment context with equal protection, you can see how that works. With the Fourth Amendment, it's tough. Is, is Snowden supposed to do even more spying on everyone? You know, uh, uh, um, it's tough to know how he could have violated the laws he was critiquing, so he had to be more indirect in his actions and his exposure. Um, uh, another potential problem, depending, depending on how you understand civil disobedience. And finally, the one that's gotten the most attention, submission to punishment. So this is famously a feature of Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. You have to uh, lovingly, as he says, um, uh, submit to punishment if you're going to be a civil disobedient. And that's a mark of your uh, respect for law and, and your society, even as you are breaking the law in one in one, uh, in one sense. Um, this is the paradox of civil dis disobedience. You know, it's, it's on one level, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's law flouting, but at a deeper level, it's meant to be law respecting. Um, uh, so, so, so Snowden, of course, has fled the jurisdiction. Uh, and for some, this is dispositive that he's not a civil disobedient. Um, 
I, it, here too, I think it's more complicated. Um, for one thing, he did come forward very quickly with his identity and what he did. So in that sense, he has exposed himself to um, uh, uh, other types of punishment. Um, and in response to this notion that it, it's just patently ridiculous to think this guy's a civil disobedient when he's not before a jury of his peers in the Eastern District of Virginia, where he belongs, um, Snowden has made, I think, an interesting move. He's basically said in so many words, um, that's not my community. Um, that's not the, the, the community of, of peers to which I am appealing. In Hong Kong, when he was there, he said, I'll let the world judge uh, my fate, whether I deserve punishment or, uh, or not. Um, and you might think that's a slippery move on his part, but I think he has a sincere kind of cosmopolitan uh, ethics. Um, he sees the world of internet users uh, read most of the world, you know, as, um, as the relevant community here. So um, the notion of the Eastern District of Virginia being the site of punishment for him uh, 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 doesn't track, um, and uh, his sense of what he's doing and who his normative community is. So um, I, that, that may be unsatisfying, that little presentation, because there's no clean answers, but that's kind of my point here. I, th I think the ambivalence you were referring to reflects um, how Snowden doesn't fit in neatly to the traditional paradigms for civil disobedience uh, or whistleblowing. Um, I'll just say quickly um, on the uh, uh, where do we go from here issue that, that Mike in particular raised, but, but also on the journalism side was touched on. Uh, um, I think one big problem in, in thinking about whistleblower reform is um, uh, congressional incentives. And I, I think you, you, this was alluded to in your comments, but um, does Congress even want uh, uh, a lot of this information um, uh, uh, what, what would Congress have done if Snowden had followed appropriate channels and gotten information to Congress? Um, in his case, at least, it seems not much. Um, and I just want to introduce two other data points suggesting that Congress um, isn't particularly interested in a lot of these cases, and therefore that reform may have to come through more unconventional routes. Okay, so the two data points I would flag are, one, um, uh, the lack of use of the speech or debate clause. This is another constitutional provision that doesn't get as much attention uh, as the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment in these debates. The speech or debate clause, in case you don't know, is, is, is in the Constitution in Article I. It says that no member of Congress can be punished for speech or debate made in the course of his or her uh, uh, conduct paradigmatically, legislative conduct paradigmatically, uh, uh, speeches on the Senate or House floor. Um, so this says, I mean, if Ron Wyden had been so stirred by what he was finding out that he just took to the Senate floor and said, you'll be outraged at what's happening here. Um, uh, let me tell you about the prison program or what have you. Um, uh, he could not have been subject to civil or criminal sanction. He might have been subject to reputational sanction, might have been cut out of his committee, but he could not have been prosecuted or civilly charged uh, uh, for that uh, action. So th it seemed unthinkable to him, I think, that, that he would do that. He sent angry letters saying, uh, Americans would be outraged if they knew what was happening, but he didn't, um, uh, se seemingly, he didn't seriously contemplate actually uh, uh, taking upon himself to reveal anything. Um, uh, there, there, there are a lot of complicated questions about whether, when that might ever be appropriate, but there is a provision in the Constitution that's like a whistleblower protection provision for members of Congress, and it's fallen into desuetude. It's basically uh, uh, never used. It was used by Mike Ravel in the Pentagon Papers case. I can talk about that. People won in 1973. It's withered since then. Second data point on Congress a uh, 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 lack of interest in a lot of these issues. Um, there is another uh, uh, provision. Uh, this one is not constitutional. It's in the rules of the House and Senate um, Intelligence Committees. They both have the same rule, and it's a declassification provision. Um, both the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees, uh, since they were constituted after the Church Committee, have had these provisions saying, and I'm going to read from uh, them, that the committees may disclose publicly any information in the possession of such committee after determination by such committee that the public interest would be served by such disclosure. That includes classified information. Um, and there was a debate about it at the time, and it was thought that this would be um, a, a kind of uh, middle ground between individual employees going rogue uh, with, with information and uh, it never coming out. The Senate Intelligence Committee would mediate uh, uh, those disputes and could declassify itself. That, that provision, a student has just written a paper uh, on this, so at least if he did his research well, and I think he did, has never been used uh, by either the Senate or the House Intelligence Committee. They, uh, reportedly, it's sometimes uh, bantered about in negotiations, but it's actually never been, the, the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees have never declassified a document using that power. Um, uh, just, uh, I think, more evidence of the need to look elsewhere. So, so all I'll say on that, where to look elsewhere, is I think um, solutions might take different forms. They might look like, um, uh, uh, technological solutions or journalistic solutions, 
to deal with sources in new ways that might be really low tech, like letters, or really high tech, like encryption or drop boxes. Um, uh, alternatively, we might think about new kinds of uh, affirmative defenses for um, uh, uh, leakers and whistleblowers um, who, who do face punishment um, about how they serve the public interest. I could talk more about ideas there. Um, and I'll, as I'm out of time, I'll cut myself off. But I, but I think the message I just want to impart is that um, traditional uh, uh, measures that depend upon Congress to actually care about and respond to what they learn from whistleblowers, which has been our kind of old model, um, uh, may not be fully up to the job. I want to ask the panel to reflect, and, and maybe Mike, I'll turn to you first uh, because of your personal background, on the calculus of the whistleblower and you know how that individual weighs up the risks, the benefits, and maybe a reflection on how Snowden may affect that equation. Uh, you know, obviously he uh, he's a hero in some circles. You know, his life is is permanently transformed and circumscribed. And so I'm wondering if you can reflect on, on that delicate calculus and uh, you know, how it looks different today than it maybe did a year ago. Sure. You, you know, I think like me, I don't think anybody goes into government service, I'm sure Peter would say the same, because they want to be a whistleblower, right? I mean, I wanted to go in government service because I wanted to be an FBI agent and protect the, the community from criminal threats. And uh, so, I, you know, I think there's an institutional pressure to conform in any institution. And this is just an institution that has this cloak of secrecy that allows it to do much more than we normally feel in society. So it's, you know, it's a very difficult decision. And I think most people take that, don't do that lightly. And it's, it's interesting since uh, I you know, came out of the FBI and worked uh, in the ACLU's legislative office, and often whistleblowers would call me, or people about to be whistleblowers would call me and say, hey, I know you went through this, you know, can you give me some advice? Not legal advice, but just advice on sort of how to do it. And I always say, the first question I always ask is, are you willing to lose your job over this? And if their answer is no, I tell them not to say anything and to go back to their job and as troubling as it is to them to ignore it, because if they raise concerns and, and bring it to the next level, the likelihood is that they're, they're going to lose their job. And I think what David said is exactly right. The big frustration, it was for me personally and, and for all these whistleblowers I've tried to help, is that you know they hear a member of Congress railing against some policy and they say, you know, if I can only get it to that person's desk, but, you know, when I, as, as their rep representative or, or assistant, try to get somebody in Congress to listen to them, they run. They don't want to hear from whistleblowers. You know, the whistleblower is just going to bring them a problem they probably don't have the tools to solve. And then they're going to get blamed for not having addressed the problem. Just have them call here. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing, you know. What the law protects is going to Congress. You know, I, I'm not aware of any whistleblower who was charged, and you know, one thing that hasn't come up on the panel, this administration has charged more whistleblowers and press leakers than all other administrations combined. So the aggressiveness is uh, incredible. With, with Espionage Act, you know, in, in more aggressive and more creative ways than any previous administration. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, an increasing problem and you know, going to the press is, is risking 30 years in jail. Many people view it as at odds with the values or the, ca the campaign ethos of this president and this administration, and yet it's now at this point a definite enough pattern and deliberate enough pattern that's been called out time and time and again. And so I, th I don't think it can be excused or, or explained away easily, and I'm wondering what the members of the panel make of this. Is this a, a bugaboo of this White House, uh, and, and, and why? Ray? I'd like to take a stab at that. Um, the president often is in the position of not telling the truth. 
Now, um, how many of you think that the president was correct when he bragged about signing an executive order that would have given Ed Snowden protection? How many think that he was correct? <laughs> that was not correct, okay? How many think that the president was correct when he advertised the existence of those two hijackers in San Diego <clears throat> and said, if NSA only had that telephone number, and that's what we can get from this bulk collection. How many think that that was correct? Well, I want to tell you folks, NSA had that telephone number. NSA had that telephone number and seven intercepted conversations between the safe house in Yemen and that telephone number in San Diego that belonged to those two hijackers of the plane that went into the Pentagon. Now, I know that because the person at NSA who was asked to investigate that, Tom Drake, came up with that conclusion and told his, his superiors, and they said, oh, I wish you hadn't told us that. You're switched to a different job. Did they have the seven conversations? They had the content of those seven conversations, and they sat on it. They didn't share it outside of NSA. They didn't give it to the FBI or anybody else. So for the president to suggest, and for the former director of the FBI, and for several other high luminaries to suggest that the bulk collection is going to work because it would have found that other number when that number, another number was found as easily as caller ID, folks, okay? That's, that's very disingenuous and makes me wonder about the president. I, I used to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was being deceived or being given what we in the trade call plausible deniability, all right? But now I think he's afraid. I think he's afraid of the security organs of this, of this country and it'll be very interesting, very interesting, to see whether he takes John Brennan's part in this big uh, dust-up or whether he'll take Dianne Feinstein. I think it's probably what the Germans call a Sturm im Wasserglas, a, 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 a tempest in a teapot. It'll blow over. Nobody will get, get cashiered. Everybody will just kind of shake hands and say, oh, okay. Uh, last thing I'll say is for Dianne Feinstein today, to be so protective of the Fourth Amendment rights. <laughs> Hello? The Fourth Amendment rights of her committee. What about the rest of us? You know, this is giving hypocrisy a bad name. David? Um, <laughs> all right, uh, uh, I'll say some less interesting things on the, uh, on the question about whether the, the rate of uh, prosecution enforcement against leakers um, is here to stay, the new higher rate, or, or not. I think it's too early um, to tell. And I also think, it, it, in part, it's too early to tell because it's unclear why there's been more enforcement under this administration. Um, it may be kind of overdetermined. So I think there are a number of factors that, that are candidates for explaining why we've seen more prosecutions. Um, some of them are, are institutional. Uh, it wasn't until 2006 that the Justice Department got a national security division by statute. Um, prior to that, the FBI alone had handled uh, criminal leak investigations and cases, and for whatever reason, it had, been, had had a pretty um, hands-off approach. Um, I think it's plausible that the national security division has brought more resources and also a more national security-focused mindset to the Justice Department's work on leak matters. Um, it's now the case that the national security division shares authority over those cases with the FBI. Um, also institutionally, um, the rise of the intelligence community, um, it's been going on for a long time, but particularly since 9-11, um, I think has played a role. The intelligence community has long been an executive branch outlier in favoring strong enforcement against leakers, and they seem to have gained in strength uh, internally over recent years, and it's also reported that uh, the Obama White House um, uh, has not wanted to cause uh, ripples with them or, or, or be seen as weak before them. Um, and then there are kind of, I don't know what to call them, ideological reasons that are also plausible, um, that, uh, uh, which relate to things like um, uh, more fear these days about more leaks by more employees uh, uh, to more media outlets. You know, uh, uh, no longer is it just a parlor game of high-level officials talking with their counterparts 
uh, at the New York Times and the Washington Post, but we now have millions of employees with access to classified information. Um, uh, it's in digital form, so it's more easily exfiltrated. They now have access to a much wider swath of media outlets which may not play by Beltway uh, uh, norms, may not have the same kind of repeat relationships with high-level officials that tend to constrain them and so forth. Um, so there may be kind of genuine or strategic uh, fears about the damage that can be done by leaks today that, that, in the view of some at least, call for a tougher response. So um, add that all up, and I think some combination of those factors and plausibly others accounts for why we've seen more enforcement. Um, but whether or not that's going to stabilize uh, depends a lot on uh, how much, you know, how painful it is for the administration to be seen as cracking down on leakers as it has. I guess I would just like to throw in the tech. My, I see things through a tech lens, but you just have to think about the fact that there, there wasn't this amount of surveillance even 10 years ago. Technologically, this is an administration that just simply has more information at its power than any other one before it. And the next one will have more. And I see no reason to think that any government imbued with this incredible power to see every single conversation taking place in their country would not succumb to the temptation to crack down on things that they don't like, and particularly when we have so much overclassification and so everything is criminalized when you talk to the press. And so I think this, I see it through the lens of ubiquitous surveillance. This is one thing we have to recognize that the world we live in, ubiquitous surveillance has enabled this, and I don't see a reason that any further administration wouldn't take advantage of it either. I'll just add, to, I should have said, yeah, technologically, it's, it's, it's easier to catch leakers now without having to subpoena journalists, which is which has often been something administrations have been unwilling to do because the, the journalists fight back hard. And the only thing I would add, I think those are, are great, and I'll, if you won't plug it, I will. <laughs> David's piece called The Leaky Leviathan goes into this quite a bit. Um, but I think what's interesting about it is this attempt to suppress the press and to suppress whistleblowers has actually created the new phenomenon of the mass disclosures, right? If you listen to Edward Snowden, he says, I looked at the example of Tom Drake, who had gone through channels, who had done discrete leaks to journalists to try to explain a, a small part of the problem, and I realized that wasn't going to work, and that that would just simply get me charged with espionage and silence. So that's why he decided to do just a mass dump, which, you know, getting back to whether it's civil disobedience, you know, the warning was Tom Drake. <laughs> you know, the minimizing the damage was that there wasn't an alternative remedy to getting it to the public because, the, you know, he was going to bring it to the Congress who authorized it. <laughs> that certainly wasn't going to reform them. You know, it, it was really to bring it to us so that we would compel Congress to authorize it. Yeah, if I could just uh, add uh, um, Tom Drake, uh, Jessalyn Radek, um, Colleen Rowley and I saw Edward Snowden on the 9th of October in, in, the, in, in Russia. And I'll just report one very poignant moment. Uh, when we walked into this room where Ed was already there, um, I was the first in and he knew who we were coming and so he said, hi Ray, but then his eyes fixed on Tom Drake who was right behind me. And he stopped. And I could see what he was thinking. It was so poignant. He said, this is the guy whose example, this is the guy who spent four years of persecution so that I could know that if I was to fulfill my mission, there was no way I, I could do that without getting out of Dodge, OK? And here I am in some wonderment that I'm still relatively free and still alive. And then I looked at Tom. Tom's looking at Ed Snowden, and he's saying, my God, you know, that was four years of torture. And I never thought any good could come out of it, but, but this is good. This is good. It was an incredible moment. And Tom, of course, gave him our uh, corner brightener candlestick holder, which is our Emmy or our Oscar for, for awardees of the Sam Adams, the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and Intelligence. So what Ed said, as Mike just related, as soon as he got to Hong Kong, as I did this because I saw what happened to, to uh, Tom Drake. So 
Tom, Tom and, and uh, Ed just bonded, and we, we talked into the night till 1.30. Uh, it was just a really, really beautiful experience. And this guy is the real deal. I've never seen anybody quite so articulate, quite so knowledgeable. After I read the, the commendation and I gave him the award, I said, now, Ed, it'd be appropriate for you to say a couple words, if you like. He said, oh, yeah. Well, he sat down. And it was though he had he'd prepared a 20-minute script. There was nothing in front of him. He just talked in a very coherent way about what was going on in Congress, you know, in our Congress, and how, you know, I said to him, are you aware, Ed, that just last week, it was four days pre pre previous, that um, the former head of the CIA and the NSA had said that you should be put on the assassination or otherwise known as the kill list, and that the head of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers, had chimed in and said, yeah, I can help you with that. Now, this was not a, a closed meeting of the mafia, folks. This was an open meeting run by the Washington Post to talk about terrorism, okay? Uh, the Washington Post didn't report this the next day for some unexplained reason. I asked Ed, are you aware of that? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, Ray, you know, I follow, I follow this pretty closely, this stuff, you know? And then he looked at me and said, what's going on, Ray? What is going on? I mean, General Hayden has lots to hide, okay? He was the guy that broke his oath to defend the Constitution and got, let himself get suborned by Dick Cheney to violate the First Commandment at NSA, which is, thou shalt not eavesdrop on Americans without a court warrant, okay? Cheney said, forget about it, forget about it. And Cheney said that before 9-11, and what did General Hayden do? He forgot about it. And so two former NSA directors have said, one, he should have been court-martialed on the spot. The other one said he clearly broke the law. Questions from the audience. Uh, the gentleman in the striped tie uh, on the aisle. Yes. There's a mic coming around, so please wait until the mic. Yes. I, I, I'm, I write about, uh, actually, my background is government oversight. And I'm very interested in uh, anything that might um, impair the functioning of democracy. And there's two things that, um, that uh, Mr. Snowden's leaks have, have brought out, plus all of the other information that have come out, much of it from leaks, about ubiquitous uh, electronic monitoring. And my concern is that uh, how can you have the Constitution functioning and a democracy if all the conversations of everyone that are electronic, including the Congress, including all of the executive branch, including all of their staff, um, have been recorded, and I gather they are recorded even though the metadata is needed to look at where the, where the recordings are. Uh, so if that's the case, how can you have a meaningful democratic process if all of the legislators are open to potential blackmail? And maybe anyone could answer as they like. Sounds almost like a rhetorical question, but <laughs> I will uh, see if anyone in our panel wants to comment. I mean, I guess I just sort of, um, I that's sort of the premise of my book, Dragnet Nation, which is basically, do we have freedom of speech in a world of total surveillance? Because once you know you're being watched and that it can be used against you, you will censor your speech. There is plenty of evidence of that. And so I raised the question of, can we live as a democracy in that world? And um, how can we fight back? Yeah, exactly. You know, this happened before. This is J. Edgar Hoover on steroids, folks. And for those who say, well, I have nothing to hide, you know, well, let me cite my old friend Wolfgang Schmidt from the Stasi, the East German secret police, okay? He said, it is naive to say that this data will not be used against you, okay? It's naive because that's what secret organs of government do. And the only way to prevent it is to prevent them from collecting this information, period. And that's the truth, folks. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to call on the, uh, in the black blazer with the blue scarf. 
Thank you so much. This has been an incredible evening, and thank you for all of your work. Um, two fast things. Um, Edward Snowden was right. Encryption works, but not if there's a key logger on your device. So you have to have a clean boot. And the other thing is, I think you're all familiar with SD cards and the uh, little micro SD cards. Uh, put your data on a, a micro SD card. You can sew them into your clothing. They go through the wash really well. And, uh, but just make sure if you're traveling internationally, you uh, boot on a clean machine. Uh, but I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. But all the whistleblowers we ever hear from are federal whistleblowers. Uh, Chelsea Manning, uh, Edward Snowden, Thomas Drake. What about the corporate whistleblowers who are, have absolutely no protection at all? Imagine what it's like being in a bank and going to the SEC during a major investigation where executive vice presidents have lost their jobs. What do you think happens to that person uh, when they, uh, the bank finds out what they're saying? And with all the fraud with the mortgage and banking industries, don't you think it's kind of strange we haven't heard more from whistleblowers? So my question is, how do we broaden this discussion to include corporate whistleblowers? Is that even real realistic? And thank you for all you've done. So when, uh, when the whistleblower lobbyist groups that I was working with would talk about whistleblower protections, they would refer to the gold standard as the Sarbanes-Oxley protections for corporate whistleblowers. So they actually have the best protection, which is really kind of surprising. And you know, even that is not necessarily great. But compared to what the federal government has generally, and the fact that the intelligence community that are arguably, you know, the people we need to protect most, right? They're out there protecting us, mm -hmm. and yet we're not willing to protect them when they're trying to do the right thing to make sure that both our security and our rights are being protected. In the back uh, here, the mic is coming. Maybe more of a comment than a question, but, uh, in, when I was Af in Afghanistan in 2012, I was thinking about how do we get government working better? Because I'm a, I was a JAG reservist, I'm a lawyer, and I, the type of issues here, whistleblowing, it's similar to retaliation in employment law, corporate. And um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is really, um, you know, I was also listening to some f tapes on the, the federalist, anti-federalist debate debates in the, by our founding fathers. And I was thinking they would be rolling over all of them in their graves if they knew what was going on right now with secrecy. So the founding fathers created a government, what, created by geniuses to be run by idiots? Mm -hmm. Something like that was, was the saying. But what's happening, it seems to me, is we're allowing the government to get corrupted with the power. And even though, in a way, it's preaching to the choir this whole discussion, how do we get the American public to see what the Founding Fathers saw, which is power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and we need the people, the general population, to recognize that their liberty depends on people standing up for their liberty. That, that's how I see it. So how do we shape public perceptions so that they're more receptive to the kinds of arguments that this panel is making, David? Well, I was going to, th I think public perceptions are, are evolving quickly um, uh, in this space. I was going to respond actually with, with, a, with an anecdote, uh, which is, um, uh, might be of interest. Uh, I was at an event, public event, some weeks ago with the then uh, deputy director of the NSA, um, Chris Inglis, um, who, who was very smart and impressive, um, and he, it was, it was notable that he was appearing in a public forum at all. And uh, a, a, a questioner came up in the Q&A and stood up and uh, to loud applause at the end said, you know, read off um, a, a litany of charges about how awful what the NSA was doing is and said, uh, uh, and, and concluded uh, resoundingly by saying um, that, that Chris Inglis is running a conspiracy um, and loud applause and without missing a beat, uh, Chris Inglis said, well, you call it a conspiracy and I look at it and I see um, judicial approval. We have the FISA court signing off on what we're doing. I see congressional approval. Um, uh, Congress knew about what we were up to and passed the enabling legislation. I see executive branch approval. These programs were known to the president and run according to uh, executive order. Um, you call it a conspiracy, Madison would have called it a government. You know, and, and, uh, and I thought, um, uh, one, that was a brilliant uh, <laughs> response in context. And uh, two, well, you know, that. 
it's a like simulacrum of a government. You know, it, it, it's uh, uh, each of those institutional actors, each of those branches in your story is, is not fully uh, uh, participating in the original uh, uh, conception. You know, the, the FISA court is not fully in Article III court. I, I, I won't belabor the point, but um, but I think that goes to the uh, 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 deeper issue you raise that you know, in some sense, what's again, what's I think so difficult about these issues is um, uh, that what happened here um, is at least superficially compatible with our classic understandings of separation of powers and the founders intent. You know, the, the, this Congress largely did approve what happened here, um, uh, at least apart maybe from the metadata and, uh, uh, and, and the FISA court approved and so on. Um, so I think that just speaks to, um, uh, you know, that you get, I guess basic your point about, about public involvement to the point where um, we invigorate these mechanisms like FISA and congressional oversight so that they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're no longer weak and, uh, and we just open up more of the process and probably impose more categorical restraints about what can be done uh, at all. I could go on, but I'll stop there. I think that also, you know, um, I would just like to add that, you know, one thing that I think hasn't been discussed enough and might be the thing that gets people outraged is that we simply are just spending incredible amounts of money on these programs. And this is a country where we need to be spending maybe that money on education and infrastructure. And I'm hoping that the conversation also evolves to that a little bit because what is the return on investment we're getting for the 80 billion that we're putting into intelligence these days? Okay. And I think to Chris Inglis's point, uh, I, would, I would argue that he misses the critical component of democracy. <laughs> yes, three branches were involved, but the people weren't. Yeah. Yeah. So those branches yeah. can't respond to the will of the people if the people don't yeah. have public information, which was yeah. the old Madison line. Uh, and that's what the critical element is, and that's why the conversation has changed, because we have more information. I mean, this, this dust-up between the Intelligence Committee and Senator Feinstein and the CIA is over an Intelligence Committee report that was completed two years ago, and they're waiting for the CIA to give them permission to publish it. Right, right. That's insane, yeah. mm -hmm. right? That's the, 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 the watchdogs are supposed to be watching this, not being watched by them. Yeah, another, another way of saying this is that, at least in my experience, and I'm 75, this is the first time I've seen the three branches of our government complicit in violating our Constitution. You look at it, it's exactly what's happening, okay? And, uh, you know, if you look at who's profiting from all this, or who's, who's getting all the money, uh, it's the corporations, it's the contractors, it's the people that NSA depends on and others depend on. And so you come very close, perilously close in my view, to Mussolini's classic definition of fascism, where the corporations and the government and the media and the security organs all are kind of mingled and complicit. We're very close to that now, folks, and I think that's what we have to be aware of. I want to get in a, a couple more questions before we have to close in about five minutes. Uh, Peter Van Buren. Today, you, you talk about not having a name for what we all now recognize, and I, I'd like to suggest a name, and that, that's post-constitutional America. The comments that Mr. Posen made and, and the NSA uh, person made are disingenuous at best in that the Congress, the, these are not what is, Amer America is the documents that create those bodies. And the Bill of Rights is remarkably explicit and, and beautifully brief in what it says. Warrantless search, you can't do that. Fifth Amendment says that people have rights of due process. There's no exception in there for a really miserable terrorist who the president can declare must be killed by a drone, whether he, even though he's an American citizen, and we will get his son at the same time in the case of Awaki Himen. These are very explicit statements, and they have carried our country through 240 years. There's no need to pretend that a secret court that makes secret decisions behind secret doors with only one side arguing has anything to do with justice, never mind the Constitution. And a Congress that rubber stamps 20,000 page bills without reading the words of them, I don't think we can consider that part of any process that the founders had in mind. We are at, at a why in the road, and, and Snowden in his testimony to the European Union this week was, was very explicit at this. The J. Edgar Hoover days that, that Ray cited 
were held back in large part by the technology. Mm. Hoover had to send men in ballet tutus into the rooms next door to drill holes in the walls to run microphones in there. We've passed that. We've crossed the technological barriers where there are none anymore. Literally, there, there's nothing that can't be done technologically, electronically. The last turn in the road is the one before us right now. Will we restrain ourselves in line with the Constitution as held us, or will we not? Snowden, to give him the final word, said, if we don't do something now, our children will never know what privacy is. They'll never have a private thought, a private moment, something that isn't observed on, by someone. And that is the place we're standing right now, what I will call post-constitutional America. Thanks for your comment. Uh, I'll take a question in the front row. Thank you. I'm hoping that I, I, I really, it's not a word game, um, and I'm not being a wise guy, and I, but I want to ask Susan this of yourself. Um, this is the Center on National Security at Fordham University, balancing security and justice, but really that's not w what we've gotten from the panel. Um, it's really, it's not that. It might be balancing oligarchy, aristocracy, and tyranny and ju versus justice. Um, but in fact, it is the conceit of the government that this is, what this is about is national security. Therefore, we had to, in order to surveil the American people, we pretended to bounce it off these foreign calls for a while. So it has a, they're telling us that they're keeping us safe and this is in the interest of national security, when in fact they're collecting data on us to better exploit us, whether it be through the corporate structure or through the government structure. And so, has it ever, you know, has it sort of really genuinely occurred to you to, to change the name, to alter the name, and, and is, that, is that something to be considered? Well, if it is to be considered, it wouldn't be by me, because I'm from the pen, the pen America piece of this. So I'd have, to, I'd have to refer your question to Karen, and maybe you could take it up with her uh, at, at the conclusion of the panel. I think we have time for just one more uh, quick question, and I'll, I'll call on the uh, woman in the black blouse. Uh, if we can go to her quickly and, and have a very quick response, and then we're going to need to wrap up. Hi, thanks. thanks for a really very informative evening. Um, I'll direct this to Ray and then anyone else. I was shocked. I was leaving home and I heard about Dianne Feinstein. And my thought was, why in public against Brennan and against Obama? What does she have to gain? Why didn't she do it behind closed doors? Well, I think if, if you read the speech, and I, I breezed through it quickly, she indicated that the, this was a month, there's many months in the making, that she did go to the president before, and she didn't get any satisfaction. Um, Brennan has a lot to hide, frankly. He was around when torture was conceived. He was a big fan, openly, in, in Lehrer's program, of what he calls uh, extraordinary rendition, otherwise known as kidnapping. The general counsel of the CIA, before they would approve him to become the general counsel of the Pentagon, was required by Senator Udall to admit that the CIA had lied repeatedly about the torture. Now, nobody caught, the only person that caught that was Jane, Jane Mayer, okay? And you had to read it real carefully, but so, so they lie all the time. Uh, Senator Feinstein didn't seem to mind it till now, uh, but now, uh, you know, Udall and uh, Wyden are really getting, getting some, some cojones, so to speak, and uh, she's very embarrassed by this delay, and she should be. Now, whether anything comes of it or, uh, or whether it's just posturing, that remains to be seen. Uh, and I, I doubt whether she's very serious. Thanks, so, I'm gonna give uh, Mike the final yeah. word. So, uh, so we're, we're, uh, what, what Senator Feinstein said was that she was responding to leaks by the CIA that were blaming her, her staff, her, the, the committee staff, uh, for doing things that they didn't do. But one of the interesting things she pointed out was that the criminal referral the CIA made to the Justice Department about the Senate staff uh, was sent over, according to her, by a, a uh, acting general counsel of the CIA who was mentioned 1,600 times in the report. So, so well, 
On that note, we sort of ended where we began, and I want to thank uh, this terrific panel for all of your insights. <laughs>